<laughs> I hate to interrupt all this good uh, visiting and fellowship, but it's uh, time to start our class. So uh, we welcome everyone to uh, our our class today and our online viewers and we can't think of a more beautiful day than to meet and to am I not coming through okay. uh, can't think of a more uh, beautiful day than to come together to worship our God we appreciate all of everyone's attendance We have uh, a couple of announcements. One is uh, at the men, um, October the 1st at 9 o'clock in the annex, there will be a men's breakfast. And Monty uh, Petty John will be speaking and enjoying the victories. So that's October the 1st at 9 o'clock. And then I also will have a uh, uh, list to pass around for the LCU pie booth needs for uh, pies and a few cakes. And I think we just got through doing it for uh, the children's home. But anyway, this is another, another list for LCU, and I'll pass it around. And I, other than that, I guess that's all, plus our prayer list will pass. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for the many blessings that you've created. And one of those is being able to come together to study your word and praise you and we just ask that you be with kevin as he presents the lesson to us today and just be with him and his thoughts and just continue to go with us and in christ's name we ask amen also for god i think we'll have dan rouse with us so uh, we're uh, glad to have you If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 will be there in just a moment. We are excited to have Dan and Carol with us. Uh, looking forward to our time in worship together as well. Oh, Bill wanted me to mention is already starting to panic a little bit the the box is fairly empty with candy uh, he's already talking about October 31st and trick-or-treat yeah so start bringing your candy uh, keep Bill calm we can't have Bill going around being nervous you know as we, we got to keep him calm as much as possible right so go ahead and start bringing your candy or bring in your dollar bills that would work as well and he would take any of that all right, we're looking at bearing with one another this morning. Not exactly the same that we talked about last week in the idea of bearing one another's burdens, but this one has to do with putting up with one another. Now, none of us ever struggle with that, right, Linda? <laughs> Tom? Yeah, I have to put up with both Tom and Linda. Not the other way around, right? Yeah, yeah, we know better. Yeah, we know better. Yeah, just wait. We've been saying all along in this study, though, that the one another passages are all about relationships. And anytime that you start dealing with relationships, you start dealing with things that are difficult. Um, we love one another, but we irritate one another. 
uh, years and years ago, I think it was Mike Cope who actually mentioned this, that, that he said the church is made up of a bunch of folks that are like porcupines. You, you understand porcupines, right? In the middle of winter, it starts to get cold and frosty, and so they huddle together for warmth, and what happens? Well, they start poking one another. And so it doesn't take very long before they start separating from one another, but now they're cold and bleeding, right? And so they come back together, and it's this thing back and forth and back and forth. We need one another. We, we obviously know that. But we need that, that, that community uh, and that fellowship with one another. But when we get together, we tend to poke one another a little bit, right? And so when we're looking at this, when we start, th- uh, think- start thinking about relationships, we need to understand what, what Paul has to say here. Think about Paul. Think specifically about him in talking about this. He has an awful lot of relationships, yes? Right? Churches that he's established, individuals that he sent in different places. Did every relationship go well with Paul? So, when he says to learn how to bear with one another, does he have any credibility when he speaks? Yeah. Did he struggle with some of those relationships? Yeah, obviously. Okay. I'm not sure Peter would have thought of him as his best friend. After Galatians chapter 2, you remember where Paul confronts him face to face and says, you're doing exactly opposite of what you're supposed to be doing when it comes to the Gentiles. In fact, you've even taken Barnabas away in your hypocrisy relationships are tricky things guys they're not easy to always to navigate and so when we're looking at this particular one another passage it, it's in, it, it's really important that we get a hold of everything that he's trying to get us to understand we're looking at this phrase to bear with and the word itself actually has to do with bearing with or to put up with to endure to tolerate But a lot of those words we would look at and say, I'm not really sure how that one fits with the rest of them. To tolerate one another? Okay, I'll tolerate you, but where's the the emotion? Where's the connection in that? Because typically when we think about tolerating one another, it's, right? It's that look, Linda, is that the right look? Is that pretty close? Yeah, yeah, that's the look. That was the look. But, but typically when we think of that, it's more, I don't like you, but I have to be with you. Yes, if you, if you think of that particular phrase, that particular word. And so in, in the idea of tolerating doesn't, or endure with, to put up with, to bear with, um, I had a Monday morning friend <laughs> who would come to my office on Monday mornings after preaching on Sunday. And Dan's in here, so I'm not going to ask him about any of those former Monday morning friends. I just, I'll just tell you about mine, okay? This particular fellow was a leader in the church and loved the church. No question at all about that. He just didn't love my preaching. And he was fairly, hi, Monty. Just tolerate me. Uh, we'll tolerate, we'll bear with Monty for a few moments. Few moments. Okay. The Monday morning friend. No, this is not my Monday morning friend. This is not the cat. Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, he's, he's on Tuesday. No, no, but think about this for a moment. When he would have problems with anything that, that I had to say on Sunday, he would show up. And he was really good at expressing himself. Wasn't terribly good at listening to anybody else, but he was very, very good at expressing himself. He would show up, and, 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 and he would unload for however long the emotion stirred him. And sometimes it would stir for a while. All right? Anytime you knew that he came in and closed the door, it was going to be a long meeting. Mostly, I don't even know if you could call it a meeting. It was more of a listening. (laughs) He came into an elders meeting one particular time, though, and usually during all of that, 
I, I found myself early on as a, as, a, as a preacher trying to defend myself. Well, one particular elders meeting, we had already been through all this stuff before, numerous times. And so I, I just listened for a while. And afterwards, it was one of the elders who actually looked at him and said, we've already covered this. And this has been going on too long. You could have heard a pin drop in that room then, right? Because that was so uncharacteristic. And all the times that I tried to defend myself, nobody in the room spoke up. When I finally learned something about being quiet, it was the other guys who spoke up and said, that's enough. That's enough. Well, there are some situations, though he mentioned those issues are closed. I, I, I had a picture a couple of weeks ago of Theo and Ruby, our dogs right here. Well, Ruby's the little female. She is a little, she's a terrier and she's a terror as well. But she chews all over Theo. She has to. She's got to be up against him. She's chewing on his ears. She is eating his food. She's pestering him to play with her. I mean, if, if they're sleeping, she's got to be up right next to him, sometimes on top of him, right? He has to learn how to bear with. He's got a lot to put up with. Well, I want us to spend a little bit of time right here. You understand that Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about some unity things. These are some things that bring you together. And in verse 2, well, let's go ahead and read verse 1. Paul has done what he typically does in the, does in the, does, yeah, what he typically does. He does what he particular, what he's doing here is the doctrinal part, right? Chapters 1 through 3, and then the practical part 4 and following. In looking at this, he says, let's talk about how you're, going, how you're going to have this unity together. Notice. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. That idea of showing forbearance, other versions, what other versions say in that area? tolerance okay there's that word that we used before others long suffering good any other words okay so forbearing or bearing with one another now what do you see in the context right here that that would be necessary why would you need to tolerate or be long suffering or Learn how, to, learn how to deal with one another here. Anything in the context that would tell us that that, why that would be necessary? This is where you talk back. <laughs> good. No, no stresses there, right? Okay, good. What else? Okay, so what would that tell us, Stuart? If the ones are coming after that, how unified are they? What do you think? They better be and they need to be. Are they at that particular point? Okay, probably not at least where they ought to be yet. Anything else? Thank you, Mike. That's true. Paul didn't even say that, but it's still a true statement. Okay, what else? Anything else? Okay, so when we're, what I want us to do here for a few minutes is just, oh, back up, back up, back up. I still want us to look at Matthew there. All right. Some passages where these words are used in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? That's that phrase, to bear with or to forbear, bring him here to me. Tell me what's going on in Matthew chapter 17. What's happening here? What is, what is, what is Jesus having, the, having to bear with, with the disciples? It's the disciples, what? Okay, the man's son, remember, he brings his son to the disciples. He's been up on the mountain, right, with 
Peter, James, and John comes back down and he encounters this group of disciples who are just kind of standing around twiddling their thumbs, right? What is he having to put up with? Is he talking about them? Wow. Doesn't sound like really nice words, does it? Kind of sounds a little bit like the way that he talked to Peter at one particular time. Get behind me, Satan. There are some things, are there some expectations on Jesus' part that he would look at them and say, how come you guys couldn't do this? And that was their question, right? Why couldn't we do that? And he said, this only comes out by prayer and fasting. Okay? So Jesus is having to put up with a generation of folks who are not as believing, not as faith-filled as they need to be. Here's another passage found over in Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, and that phrase is going to be used again, or that word's going to be used again. It says, just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. That's the way the NIV reads. That same word, that idea of listening to you, is that idea of putting up with or bearing with or bearing up under. So what was it that Gallio was having to bear with? What's going on in Acts chapter 18? You're in Corinth, first of all, okay? You're at the judgment seat. You're at the bema, they call it. What's going on here? Some of you are going back reading all the way through Acts. You don't have to read all the way through Acts. Okay. There's conversions taking place in the city of Corinth, and there are people who are bringing him before the court. We don't like what he's doing. We don't want him to do it anymore. Okay? All right. Another passage found in... 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul mentions here, he says, I hope that you'll put up with me, in fact, he uses it twice, in a little foolishness, yes, please put up with me. And then down in verse 4 of the same chapter, he will make mention, he says, you bore or you were able to bear with those who brought a different gospel to you. What does he want them to hear? What does he want them to listen to? The message of the true gospel, yes? Real gospel. Not some false gospel. He says, it's, it's just the opposite with you. Somebody brings a new message and you put up with that quite well. But I'm teaching you the truth and you won't listen. Something seems wrong about that, right? Especially when we're talking about Christians. Or in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, we'll come back to this passage a little bit later on. When Paul says to the church in Colossae, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. What did they need to do as a group of Christians in the church in Colossae? To bear with one another, to put up with one another. Any problems in the church in Colossae? You remember... There's another little bitty letter that's kind of snuck in right there called Philemon. Do you know the story of Philemon? Philemon and Onesimus. Apparently Onesimus has run away from his master Philemon. Converted when he meets Paul, comes, has to come back because Paul sends him back, yes? And then has to kind of come with his hat in his hand. But it's not just about how Onesimus comes back, it's how Philemon's supposed to receive him. Yes? So when he tells the congregation, likely that's meeting in Philemon's house, how does Philemon hear this passage? Bear with one another. Do you think his head goes down pretty quickly when the reader reads this? Bear with one another. He's talking to me, he me. He's talking about... Would you feel... Would you feel that, all the eyes staring on you, maybe a little bit? Whatever grievances you have against, some, against somebody else. Or over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says that there are, there's coming a time 
when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. Putting up with something that's not true. Bearing with some things that you shouldn't allow to take place. So we understand from passages like this and some others here that there are some things we should bear with and some things we should not. Yes? Just from the way that it's used in different passages here. Well, I want us to come back to Ephesians chapter 4, come back to where we were there in verse 2, because in verse 2 there are going to be a number of modifiers that are used in this idea of being a person, a group, a body that bears with one another. And the first one is this idea of being humble with all humility, verse 2. Um, we, we talked about this before, uh, some different words that were used, in all lowliness. How do you receive something in lowliness? That's a kind of an old English word. We don't use that very much anymore. But, but, but what's, what's the mental picture you get when you hear that word, lowliness? Humble, which is, yeah. How do you see that? How do you see that in a, in a physical representation? Servant. Servant, okay, good. Are they going around bragging? Are they going around with their chest puffed out? I'm better than you. No, that's not, that's not the, it's just the opposite of that, isn't it? Um, one of the versions, I was just looking through a bunch of different versions, and one of the versions, I think it was the Amplified Bible, said, forsaking all self-righteousness. I'm better, I'm good, I'm, I'm this, I'm, mm -mm. none of that, okay? None of that at all. Another version actually talked about being humble-minded. Now, you can't go scripture and you, you certainly can't read through Paul's letters and not think about certain passages that just immediately come, come to mind. Philippians chapter 2, if you want to talk about humility, you have to look at the picture of Jesus, yes? How did he demonstrate his humility? Being God, he chose to come to this world. Not only did he choose to come to this world, but he, choose to, he was choosing each step lower and lower and lower. He became a human became a criminal, died on a cross, not just as a servant, but as a criminal as well, watching those steps come down. And it was at that point that God highly exalts him. Interesting to me that not only in chapter 2 of Philippians is Jesus portrayed, because he's the best example, but there are three successive other examples that are talked about in chapter 2 as well, Paul being the first one right after that. Because Paul will talk about in chapter 2, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, he says that's all right. That's okay. Is that humility? To be poured out as a drink offering, that word picture is what? Being completely used up. Being completely emptied. Is Paul willing to be completely emptied for the Philippian church? Yes. Then he mentions Timothy. He says, I don't have anybody like Timothy who will put your needs above his own. Timothy goes to a lot of different places, yes? Philippi being one of those. W would it be easier for Timothy not to be traveling around all these different places? Sure. And then he mentions one other person as well, Epaphroditus. What do you know about Epaphroditus? From Philippians chapter 2, he almost died serving for the church in Philippi. He's serving Paul, but he's doing it for the church in Philippi. They can't send enough money, so they send a man. And he is working on their behalf, and he gets sick to the point of death. And, he, and Paul ends up sending him back. Each of these examples are what it means to be humble. That's the first modifier. The second one, oh, see, I should have already had these up here. Okay, those are the three that we mentioned here. All right? All right. Let's talk about the second one here. And I'm just going to go ahead and put all, all these up because I'll forget otherwise. Okay? He says, with all humility and gentleness, 
Some different words that are mentioned right here, it's the same word pros, so it's meek. It's, it's the word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, okay? And so we know a couple of things from that word. We understand that when we look at meek, we're looking at the idea of power. And some of you are already saying, oh, wait a minute, you got the wrong word, Kevin. No, I've got the right word. It is power under control. It's the horse that is now tamed, that's broken. Yes? And I'm not talking about broken in pieces. I'm talking about a, a horse that now is, is useful because now he's tamed enough to be able to use him in work and whatever else that you're going to use him for. Okay? That's the word that's used here in all gentleness and meekness. Now, sometimes... It's that idea, one of the other versions use the idea of maintaining self-control. And so he's strong enough to react, he's strong enough to do something, but chooses not to. Chooses not to respond in a hateful way. Something is said, and I'm not going to respond back, and then that just escalates the situation, doesn't it? But the bottom word that's used over, you know, in, in some of the places is this idea of mild. And I don't like that word very well. I don't like that thought very well. Because when we hear mild and meek, we think of the little squeaky guy who's little bitty thing and he doesn't have enough power to do anything. Right? Are you a mouse or a man? Kind of, you know, that mentality that we used to talk about. But this word gentle or meek is found over in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 we looked at last week. The ones who are supposed to go to that person who is caught in a sin are supposed to go in a spirit of meekness or gentleness, watching out for themselves so that they don't fall into the same sin. Can you go and blow up the situation and make it worse if you don't show up in gentleness? Can you just run them off? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's going to be important that you do it in that. One of the pictures, uh, one of the commentators was talking about this idea of, especially out of, Genesis, or out of Galatians 6 and verse 2, and, and coming to a person who is in danger, he used, the, he used the illustration of a water rescue, of somebody who's drowning. Okay? Which I, what, now, how, for those of you that have maybe taken lessons and things like that and maybe been lifeguards or something or at least know something about that, how are you typically supposed to approach somebody who is drowning? Why? From behind. Yeah. Uh, do they understand what they're doing? They don't understand that, they, you know, but they're flailing. They're fighting for their lives. Will you get hit in the mix? Very likely. Very likely. And so the reasoning coming from behind is so that they won't flail knocking you out, and then you got two drownings that are going on, right? I mean, let, let's just be honest. And so the rescue is, is that person mild? Mm, got to be a bit strong, doesn't he? Or she? Don't they have to be strong in that situation to bring another person back in? Oh, yeah. But it is a strength that is under control as well. People who are in pain, we talk about it in a spiritual sense, People who are in pain or people who are panicking in the situation that they're living in at this particular point can actually do a lot of harm to the person who's coming to rescue them. And if you've been involved in that, you understand what we're talking about. The third area, let me go ahead, is that word patient, long-suffering. And... Some of the commentators will say this is really the central characteristic in all of that. When it comes to being forbearing or bearing with other people, putting up with other people, patience is the key. It's not a quick fix, guys. It's not a Band-Aid issue. It's not something like your mama did, you know, let's put a Band-Aid on it, give it a kiss, pat them on the bottom, you know, send them back out to play. It's not like that when we're talking about something this difficult. Forbearance a lot of times expresses this idea of being patient with them. Because we're dealing with folks, we're dealing with people who have weaknesses. And we have them, don't we? Yes? 
Yeah, that's the point here, isn't it? Why does he say one another? Why does he say before bearing with one another? Because it's not just about you. Yes? It's not just about somebody else. It's not just about brother so-and-so. Abe's favorite phrase, old brother churnhead, right? We're not just talking about old brother churnhead. We're talking about everybody having struggles or weaknesses and learning how to be forbearing with one another. So to bear with one another means to be patient with others in their weaknesses. We fail. We fall. We struggle. And guys, it's easy sometimes for us to expect more out of others than we expect even in ourselves. We're very patient with ourselves, aren't we? Usually. I didn't mean to do that. I know I hurt that person. I know I said something I shouldn't have. I know I did something I shouldn't have done. But we're pretty patient with one another. We know our motives. We don't always know the motives of others, do we? Boy, Look at the way they hurt that person, or look at the way they treated that person. Look at the way they did these things. In families, this often surfaces, this idea of being patient with one another. Why? Because we're with one another day after day, aren't we? The, the reason we pat one another on the back because folks have been married 40, 50, 60, 70, I don't know, any 80, but... But because we've been married so long is what? They deal with our weaknesses, yes? For 44 years, Danny had the opportunity to see me with my hair a mess. And you guys are going, yeah. Or goo in the eyes or, or breath that could peel wallpaper. And some of you are going, okay, don't talk about me now, okay? Exactly, right? All the different parts. Now, we talk about that in a, in a relationship sense, but that happens to us. Think about our spiritual relationships. The longer we spend with one another, the longer we will get to know one another. And we will get to know all about one another, right? Yes? We will really get to know one another. And so... The temptation to be impatient often will win over the desire to bear with one another. Don't you know that Paul was grateful to God for his forbearance and his patience with him? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17 talk not only about God's grace and his mercy that he would allow him to be one of his representatives, but he uses that word patient in there as well, that God was patient with him. As strong a personality as Paul was, do you think God had to be patient with Paul a little bit? For those who are, I didn't want to say get her done kind of people because that, that brings up Larry the Cable Gun. I didn't want that picture, right? But, but, but the kind of people who actually get stuff done, and actually, they're the go-getters, right? Are there times where we have to be patient with them and maybe slow them down a little bit and ask some questions? Yeah, yeah. Does Paul, is Paul grateful for the way that God was patient with him? And do you think that had an impact on the way that he would treat other folks? Do you think Paul ever remembered that? Even in that situation with he and Barnabas over John Mark, later on, what does Paul do? Hey, bring Mark with you. Do you think he and Barnabas made up? Doesn't tell us in Scripture, but my guess is, if, if Paul and Mark made up, I'm guessing that he and Barnabas made up too. Don't you think? Right? Right? I think there were a few words exchanged, not in the heat of the moment, but maybe some hugs, a kiss on the cheek, uh, an embrace that said, I love what you're doing. I love that you felt strongly about this, and I was the one who overreacted in all of that. Now, what Paul is going to do in this is he's going to remind them, particularly both in this passage, but also over in Colossians, he's going to remind them of their own weaknesses. Before you, because we're so, we have 20 20 vision when it comes to everybody else's weaknesses, yes? It's a whole lot harder looking in that mirror and, and not looking away, 
isn't it? Looking for a while. Really looking deeply inside and saying, what about my weakness? You ever felt like that particular picture there in the chain? You ever felt like that's you sometimes? Especially when you start looking at Galatians chapter 5, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I'm doing well here, and I'm doing well here, and I'm doing well here, but there's that, there's that one. And I don't do well with that. I struggle there. I don't feel very strong. If we could, if we could look at one another like moms and dads look at their children, I think we'd be more patient, would you? Because we typically are with those who are younger, we understand. They're not as old, they're not as mature, they don't have that spirit, they don't have that physical maturity, they don't have that emotional maturity, but Guys, we look at one another in a classroom like this and see a few gray hairs and a few no hairs. and we don't, we don't see maturity levels, do we? We don't typically see, we, we, we typically don't look at, at one another in this class and say, you know, there are different levels of maturity here. People who have been Christian for, you know, Christians for many years and people who may not have been Christian for that many years. And so learning how to be patient with others, it really does matter how we see them. How are we doing? Right, We've got to move along. There's a fourth area. When he mentions it's all with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. And so there are several different words that are used in different versions here. Charitable. I love, even as I put that in and started looking at pictures right there, I love some of the different pictures, and there were hundreds and thousands. This idea of being loving. I love the picture of this. I mean, we like to imagine maybe this is granddaughter, I'm not sure, or this is daughter, or maybe, maybe this is just a, a neighbor of helping this lady in with her groceries. She's already got her hands full just trying to move and maneuver, yes? But somebody who steps in and says, here, I can do this for you. I will help. I will demonstrate what charity looks like. I will demonstrate what being kind in this kind of loving relationship looks like. I'll do something. I won't just say it. I'll show it. Or the middle one. I love that picture. I, I like to imagine the, this is husband and wife. And you see it pouring down rain. And she's in a wheelchair. Folks in wheelchairs get caught in the rain too? Sure. Do they have some extra challenges to go along with that? Of course. But for him to take the umbrella and not put it over his own head, but put it over her, I love that picture. Because that's a demonstration, that is a kindness shown in love, isn't it? To say, I'm going to place your needs above my own. I'm going to take care of you first. Or even the mom with the little boy. All of these in an atmosphere of love. I can't help but think of 1 Thessalonians when Paul will talk to them and talk about the way that he was with them both as a nursing mother. That's tenderness right there, isn't it? And as an encouraging father. He says, that's the way we came to you. And that's the way that we ministered among you. I, I love that picture in all of this. But then there's one more. And you need to flip over a couple of pages in your Bible over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Because this is the one about that's not in, in the Ephesian passage, but it certainly ought to be in our thinking as well. To be forgiving. To be forgiving. Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. Again, you know that Colossians and Ephesians are kind of sister letters. 
written at the same time. Much of the same material covered in two different areas. He says, beginning in verse 12, And so, as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, notice some of the same words. Have you caught that? Bearing with one another, that's, that's the... That's that same thought that we're talking about today, forbearing, and forgiving each other. There's that fifth point that we want to look at for just a couple of moments this morning. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And so this idea of bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if they're not synonyms, they're at least Siamese twins. They are connected, or, or not Siamese twins, what's the other? Conjoined twins. They're connected with one another, aren't they? Because the idea of bearing with whatever weaknesses you have is going to require forgiveness on my part. Yes? Go ahead and shake your head. It is going to require forgiveness. Because we're going to hurt one another. We are going to be in situations that are difficult. Bear with and forgive are both imperatives in this text. In other words... This is what you do. This is what you're supposed to do. And then he mentions the complaint department. See, we think about complaint departments right there, and we say, okay, this is our chance to, to tell everybody what we really think. Let me say something that's really important right here. Complaints must be confronted. But not in the direction that we typically think. Because when we think about confronting complaints, we, 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 we tend to think about, okay, I'm going to go tell that person what I think. And usually, I'm going to tell them what I think. I'm going to tell them what, how I feel about this. If they did this, and they did this, and they did this, I'm not talking about confronting it in them. I'm talking about confronting it in us. Those that have been hurt. Because that's the direction that Paul goes here in Colossians. He says, you... It's not about you going and getting everything right and making sure that they get everything right. He says, you take a look inside first. You do the introspective look inside you. I remember a, a fellow several years ago who told me after some really, really difficult situations that came up in church, he said, I'll never be able to forgive them. And he was talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Tells you at least the depth of the wound. And again, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, there's no way in the world we would say, well, it's not that bad. It was to him. Okay, the wound was horrendous. But to say that is to say, I don't want the forgiveness for my sin. You understand what we're saying here, right? To say, I'm not going to forgive is to say, Jesus, don't forgive me either. And none of us wants that, do we? No, all of us know how much we need his forgiveness. A little bit later in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, he says, make sure that a bitter root does not spring up among you. Where does bitterness come from? Most of the time, yeah, it starts inside, but how does it get there to begin with? It comes from not dealing with previous hurts. It comes from not dealing well with those areas that have hurt us. I've always wondered about this. I've been reading back through the life of David again, and, and this particular thing, it, David's always talked about as being a man after God's own heart. Yes? But I've wondered, toward the end of his life, do you remember there are a couple of different people that he has, he has killed, doesn't he? Remember the story of Shammai, right? You remember him? He's throwing dirt at him and dust and everything else and cursing David and all the other kind of stuff as he leaves when Absalom tries to take over the coup. But then when he comes back, it's like, oops, I messed up. And Shammai comes back to him and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll do whatever I need to do. And David says, okay. But does, does David ever forget that situation? 
I've always wondered, is he holding a grudge? Is he like God in this aspect? Because I think to myself, what did David deserve when he has Uriah killed? What did he deserve? What did he receive? Do you think he remembered back about that when he's looking at Shammai or he's looking at Joab and has both of them killed? That's always made me wonder. I wonder how well some of our folks out of the Old Testament understood forgiveness. Well, some of the areas that may be most difficult to bear with one another, maybe one of those is in marriage. In the same way we talked about it before, when we really know one another, the closer we get to one another, the easier it is for those people to hurt us, right? No one can hurt you like somebody who knows you well. Because they can say things they already know that push your buttons. Yes? They already know. And so it's not easy. But listen to me, folks. If we can't bear with one another in our marriage relationship, what does that say between Christ and the church? Remember that illustration is our marriages are to be living pictures of what it's like between the church and Jesus. Difficult? Is it difficult to say, I'm sorry? Is it difficult to confront the situation? Is it difficult to be patient? Is it difficult to be willing to forgive? Yeah, but I know they're going to do it again. I know they're going to say it again. I know they're going to bring it up again. And so we tend to, I'll I'll say you're forgiven, but I'm going to hang on to this over here until the next time. Hmm? And if it's true in marriage, I think it's also true among members of the church. I've had people sit in my office a number of different times who've talked about the deepest wounds they've ever received were in church. And some of us in here would look at that and go, wait a minute, that, that's not right. Oh, yes, it is. Because we're still human beings and we still hurt people. Even when we don't want to, we hurt people. But there are, my brother said something to me when I decided I was going to go to school back in the mid-80s. Tim told me, he said, Kevin, when you work with the church, you're going to work with some of the best people in the world. And I'm smiling, and he says, and some of the worst. It's like, and I'm thinking to myself, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It may not be the way it's supposed to be, but it is the way it is. Yes? That there are folks who are still just mean. And who are hiding in church. But they're still ungodly. So we're going to have to learn how to deal with this idea of forgiveness and forbearance. Even in those situations. All right, Kevin. What do we do with this thing? What are some of the practical steps that may help us in that? I would say to start with, you've got to look in the mirror. I think that's where we always start. Take a look in the mirror first. Find out what your weaknesses are. And some of you are thinking, weaknesses? I don't have any. Well, okay, ask your spouse. You'll find out really quickly. (laughs) Yes? If you think you don't have any, all you have to do is just nudge the person next to you, and they'll be be glad to go ahead and give you their list. Falls all the way to the ground. Ask yourself the question, what do I do or what do I not do that irritates my wife, my kids, my brothers and sisters, and then ask, is it possible that I'm doing those same kind of things to my brothers and sisters in the Lord? Take a look inside first. Number two, probably need to do some evaluation of your own attitudes and actions. What do you mean? Well, do I expect more from others than I expect from myself? 
Do I, do, I, do I hold them to a higher standard than I do even myself? Well, they shouldn't do that. Well, okay, the likelihood is you're probably right. They probably shouldn't do that. But does that give you the right not to forgive? And to throw up your hands and say, I'm not bearing with them another, I'm not going to put up with them another moment. Take a look at your attitudes and actions. Ask yourself, do I criticize others in my own area of weakness? Isn't it easier to see it in somebody else than it is to see it in yourself? Isn't that true? Well, I wish those people would get over that right there. They just do that all the time. And when we have the finger pointing out, you remember, right? How many fingers you got pointing back? Oh, wait a minute. Keep that hand down. Because so often that's exactly what takes place is it's easier to see it in someone else and to not find it in yourself. Number three, make a list. Some of you are saying, I'd need a lot of paper and a big pencil. Maybe. Now, I'm not saying make a list of people that you have wronged or that you know that you have done something, but the Lord's pretty specific about that in the Sermon on the Mount. If you know somebody's got something against you, what do you do? And we do that so well. Got pretty quiet, didn't it? Because that's probably the hardest thing on the whole page, isn't it? And don't just go to them so that you can iron out all the wrinkles and all the details. Because you may never be able to get all of that. It may just be so jumbled up. You never get it settled. But you can go to them if you've got something against them and say, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to get it right. I'm not trying to get it, you know, everything taken care of. I'm not trying to get it all straightened out. I'm just saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my attitude. I'm sorry for my thoughts. I'm sorry for the things I said. Be honest in that. Understand that what they've done has been painful. We're not saying that it didn't hurt. We're just saying that we have to forgive if we're going to call ourselves Christians, if we're going to call ourselves disciples. Number four, lastly, make a conscious effort to forgive the hurt and the one who did the hurting. What's that going to call on us to do? Make a phone call? Write a letter? Better yet, make a visit. I can say some things in a letter, got it written, send it in the mail, and I don't have to be in their presence. But a face-to-face, can they read face-to-face? Do they know that you're sincere in that? And on top of that, what else? If that relationship is restored, what typically comes? Hugs, tears. And those are all right, aren't they? That's part of this forbearing with one another. Some of you might be thinking to yourself, but okay, good idea. What if I can't? Some of those hurts came from people that are already gone. Yes? Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe it was parents, maybe it was an uncle or an aunt, maybe it was a, somebody who was around many, many years ago, or I don't have any contact information or whatever else. All right. So tell it to God then. And maybe a friend who can keep confidences, but who will still help you in this journey to make sure that you learn how to be more forbearing. All right. You all know the story of Corey Ten Boom, right? Yes? Most of us have either read or heard of 
her situation and how she was in a concentration camp in World War II. Horrendous things done. Horrendous things done. Early on, one of the hardest things she had to confront was forgiving those who hurt her in that concentration camp, actually forgiving the guards who were there. And she thought that would be the hardest thing in her life. But she mentions in this book that gets, she says that I thought that would be the hardest thing ever, but about the age of 70, I had some church people who I love dearly, who I had served and extended myself to, who hurt me deeply. And she said, that was harder. Because they said they loved me. They said they wanted to have a relationship with me, but she had to go back and confront her own attitudes. And she had to go to them face to face and personally. If she was going to be a disciple of Jesus and follow in his footsteps, that's exactly what she had to do. And she did. And she said it was the hardest thing, even more difficult than forgiving those guards. Easy? Tell me anything that tells us to do that's easy. Necessary? Very necessary. Let's pray. Father, we, um, I don't know about other folks in this room. I just know me. I know how much I need to grow in this area and learn how to be forbearing and not just tolerate them but actually do all that I can with all the attitudes that are there and humility and patience and gentleness and all those other areas in love, but particularly in forgiveness. Father, would you help grow us to become more like you in every one of the one another areas. Father, thank you for the way you forbear, not just in the past, but as you do now, forbear with us and are patient with us. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for the way you forgive us again and again and again. And help us, Father, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus in forgiving others. We thank you for him, and it's through him we pray. Kevin, thank you very much for a great lesson on one of our biggest problems we'll have of relationships. We thank you very much. We have several on our uh, prayer list. Uh, Ruby Anderson is in a Marshall Hospital and she's very ill. Gary Lindsay is, is in the hospital. Floyd Boyer is still dealing with effects of uh, chemo infusions. And she also twisted her ankle and is icing it. Mary Flournoy is not doing well, is in declining health. Remember the Habash is in uh, Egypt and Charleston's in Scotland. And Jean Westfall had knee surgery rehab on uh, this past Monday. Need to remember Ray Johnson, Janice Davis, Pat Gersama, Dolores Sutherland, and all churches. Uh, the Donovan kids that are in abusive situations and they're uh, friends of the Clarks. 
and Tana Natel has been in an accident, and he's also a family friend of the Clarks. Jackie Mize is going to come and lead us in our prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, help us to be more patient and forgiving. You have blessed us so abundantly. You sent the rain. You bless us every day. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this church, for the preachers and teachers that help us better understand your word. Please be with those that have been mentioned that are having health issues or have lost loved ones. Watch over and protect them. Be with us through this upcoming week and continue to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>